Good evening, good afternoon, and good morning to everybody who's joined us today. Um, we'll be talking with SBD's Alex Euler, BlackBerry Cunix's Justin Moon, and Amazon AWS's Stefano Marzani about multi-source automotive software stacks. Um, so let's give you a quick pricey over what's going to happen over the next hour or so. We're going to introduce the panel, take you through a few questions, let them talk to each other, and answer some of the more interesting questions around what's going on in the software-defined vehicle area this year. So first off, let's meet the panel. I will let them each introduce themselves in turn. Alex, can we start with you, please? Yeah, thanks, Kurt, and thanks, everyone, for joining today. Uh, good to see you. Um, such a, a great turnout for, for this webinar. Uh, my name's uh, Alex Euler. I'm the director of SBD North America. I've been in this role for around six months, and before that, um, I was our lead researcher for software-defined vehicle cloud and um, and over-the-air updates, um, that entire ecosystem. So um, really spent a lot of time building out our foundational research in that domain. I'm um, excited to talk to the panel today. Justin. Hey, I'm Justin Moon, um, Senior Director of OEM Engineering and uh, Advanced Products at QNX. I've been here the better part of 22 years, so uh, lots of QNX experience. Um, I've been working in automotive ever since our very first production program in 2000. Fantastic. And last but not least, uh, Stefano, can you give us an introduction, please? Of course. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, Stefano Marzani. I'm the worldwide tech lead for software defined vehicles in AWS. I'm in the automotive business unit. Um, before that, uh, I worked for two years as worldwide tech lead for autonomous driving. But you see, developing autonomous driving and developing all the out other automotive workloads is going through a big transformation. So at the end, I ended up uh, looking at the big picture. So and autonomous driving is one of the, the, the you know, the drivers and the big thing that are pushing SDV together with infotainment and other things that hopefully we will touch today. So everybody, hello, everybody. Fantastic. Thank you, guys. So when we talk about. Who are you? Oh, sorry. Yes, I am the moderator today. I, I entirely forgotten about myself. I am the moderator. I am Kurt Dusteroff, a consulting manager from SBD. My background is in infotainment and speech control, and I look after our enabling technologies. But today, I'm all about just making sure that you guys have some interesting panel conversations and uh, we get to hear from what you have to say. And with that, today we're going to be talking about software in the car and how the in industry is integrating software from all over the place in mixed, critical mixed criticality systems. Um, and how that is causing a fundamental shift in the industry, going away from functional ECUs with functional software into a software-defined vehicle. And where all of that software that has to be in these vehicles is coming from and how they can be put together. Um, so some questions we'll aim to answer today are, where does it come from? Does it matter? Um, how does the software integration, how's that impacted by the vehicle life cycle? How do we manage the software over the lifetime of a vehicle and maybe going forward in ways differently to how we have in the past. And what questions OEMs and tier ones need to ask themselves about asking how do they do that? What kind of questions will lead them to make the right decisions for their organization into uh, choosing their software and, and their integration method? Um, this will be a panel discussion. So the slides you see are just there to remind our panel what we're talking about at any given time. We're not going to run through a lot of marketing material. This is a chance for people to hear from, from the heart and from the, the, the experience of uh, some industry experts. So before we get started, though, I thought it'd be fun to see what our audience uh, have to say about a few things. So we'll ask you a question, give you a chance to answer. So if we can have our first question up. I can't see that screen. <laughs> so, Alex, can you see the screen? Yes, it's up. Can you read the question then so that everybody's got a chance to hear it uh, as well as see it? Yeah, so, so, so for those in attendance, the poll question is approximately how much of an OEM's quote unquote own build operating system or OS do you think currently comes from outside the OEM? Um, and the four options are 80%, 60%, 40%, or 
Once again, the question is approximately how much of an OEM's owned build OS do you think currently comes from outside the OEM? We'll, we'll give everybody a, a minute or so to answer that, but it's an interesting question, uh, Alex, given the number of different OEMs who've talked about building their own software. Um, so I'm looking forward to see what everybody and, has to say. And, and I think one of the, the hidden complexities with this question is what? how do you define um, an operating system, right? Because the, the lines around that you previously have been centered on a device, but um, it's been co-opted a bit to, to talk about, you know, kind of a, a broader scope within the vehicle. So actually drawing a line around what, what is meant by an OS um, is an important factor in this question. Absolutely. Now, I think we'll close that in about 10 seconds, give everybody last chance. So if you haven't answered, please click on an answer now. And All right, let's see if we can get that closed and see if an answer pops up. Go. So, Alex, what is, what's the uh, audience answer looking like? Yeah, it's it's interesting, and it, it aligns with the, about what what I would have expected. So, very top heavy. Forty seven percent of respondents indicated eighty percent, and thirty three percent sixty sixty percent. Um, so, eighty percent of of respondents overall agreed it at sixty percent or more. Um, and, and personally, I would completely agree with that that finding. We'll talk a little bit more about why that is in a moment, um, yep. but but very Fantastic. interesting. Excellent. So we've got everybody pretty much saying it's sixty percent or more. And if we can close that up, then we can come back to every time we do that, it changes. All right. So according to Dr. Dice at VW, this was about a year ago. By 2025, they wanted to own 60% of their software from going up from 10%. We've got everybody virtually in the audience saying it's 60% or higher. So if nothing else, the messaging is getting across pretty well. Um, so really, Alex, where does all this software come from? They're integrating stuff from all over the shop, but they're owning a large chunk. Where is it all coming from in reality? Yeah, and I, I think really it, it comes back to this idea of the, the vehicle OS because um, previous generations of vehicles didn't have a coordinated concept of the, the vehicle OS or vehicle software platform. It was really just um, a, a blend of you know dozens of ECUs that had their own individual software stacks, but they enabled very specific functionality across the car. So really it was just a network of individual devices that that enabled specific features and functions. Um, and, and so now, right, the, the conversation with OEMs is how can we eliminate some of this fragmentation and complexity in, in actual hardware devices and up integrate that functionality into kind of higher performance um, computers. So in, in Volkswagen's case, you know, we've been talking about the ICAS or in-car application server. In, in the broader context, this would be domain controllers, zonal controllers, um, general higher performance computers that bring together a, a number of, of functions um, and overall eliminate kind of the number of ECUs. But in order to do that, there needs to be a, a coordinated software strategy and integration model. So really talking about where the software comes from, um, I mean, there's no one size fits all. Every OEM is going to have a little bit of a different approach, but certainly everyone's thinking about you know, how do you take control of, of kind of the differentiating software in your car. So this idea of differentiating versus non-differentiating software is foundational um, to, to kind of the, the sourcing decisions. And I think we'll also get the chance to talk about that a little bit later. Um, yeah. I would say just, just kind of closing thought there, the main complicating factor in this is really around functional safety. So, you know, um, one of the one of the kind of common ideas is to leverage um, concepts, technologies, um, software projects that were introduced in other industries and then bring them into automotive. But certainly the biggest challenge with that is a, a accounting for kind of safety um, compliance and, and some of the standards that need to be adhered to there. So very much a complicating factor that our, our experts from from BlackBerry and, and Amazon can talk about as well. Thank I think the, um, the complexity side of it is actually an interesting point, Alex. If we start thinking about uh, previous complexity in, in automotive architectures of the past, we were very hardware complex. There are a ton of endpoints, a lot of wiring. Um, so complexity itself isn't new to our ecosystem or our market. Um, what we're looking at actually moving forward is 
the exchange of complexities, migrating from extreme hardware complexity into extreme software complexity. And I think that's where the commonality and foundational software are extremely important. We need to make sure that um, we're reducing the amount of friction necessary for um, the tier ones, OEMs, and you know, our, our ultimately our customers. Uh, you know, the, we're reducing the, the amount of friction necessary for them to actually leverage the technology and really differentiate where it counts for their customers. Yeah, I, I think that's absolutely true. Um, Justin, one of the things that uh, we experienced as an industry when everything was in its own ECU is everybody developed their own software for that piece of hardware. With the world of integrated software on a bigger piece of hardware that's bringing multiple functions together into a mixed criticality system, can that model work? Can it scale? Is the industry going to have to do something differently to make that complexity manageable? Right. So we talked about complexity as kind of one of those cornerstone things for, from an SDP perspective where complexity needs to be solved. But another big point is scale. Um, if everybody's building their own bespoke thing and they're building complete solutions per feature, from a from a um, an up integration perspective, it gets very difficult because now you're not only integrating middleware and application level, but you're also starting to integrate fundamental platform level software as well. Really, what we're talking about with scale um, is reuse in, in the investment that we're making into the software of tomorrow. So whether or not we're building a cockpit controller or an ADAS domain controller or a high capacity compute domain, what we need to understand is what does it mean to leverage similar foundational software such that we're increasing the potential of reuse and the economies of scale really of the investment that we're putting into software. So if we're still building the same vertical stacks, we're still building things in isolation, not only is there a cost difference in terms of how much it's going to cost for people to do these integrations, and we're talking about integration a little bit later, but uh, in terms of um, the actual complexity in the integration, it becomes very, very difficult, um, especially when you start considering the various execution paradigms that are out there, containers, cloud native binaries, virtual machines, native binaries, forget just the scale, but even, you know, Stefano, even from a, like a workload management perspective, if we're talking about multiple vertical, it gets super difficult. Maybe, you know, even, you know, if we talk about what ECS is great about and what EKS does and what they could potentially provide into this industry, if it's all piecemeal separate vertical stacks from a, from a management perspective, it can get quite difficult. You're totally right. And in fact, yeah. uh, I was uh, suggesting, and uh, just to reply to Kurt's email uh, to manage this complexity, if you think about Amazon.com or other very complex uh, systems, uh, I don't think they are, you know, very simple. But the way that the cloud manages these complex, uh, let's say, systems is through microservices, right? That's exactly why we start to talk about cloud native in automotive. How we can, uh, as we say, break down this monolith that the automotive software is currently because it's been developed and grow, right? Inside single, very, very single constrained environment and break it down in microservices with standard interfaces and that will uh, help in managing complexity for sure so and uh, i won't point out another important point uh, just in in addition uh open standards right so there's absolutely the need to simplify and refer to open standards that's why for example in our service uh, fleetwise we use the vehicle signal specification from covisa uh, this is why we you use uh, Virtaio extensively in uh, you know in the virtualization, even containing the white paper that has been diffused. So referring to things that the sector you know needs to you know converge on, it's super important. I can't understand why we continue to talk about uh, hardware consolidation, and we don't think about uh, standards consolidation or software consolidation, especially on the open on the open store the standard parts. Standardization and commonalization, I think, for access yes. to, to control and data, I think is extremely important. And, you know, really something that, you know, you know, you asked, what does the industry need to do differently? That That is one of the big things. It's commonality of access, commonality of, of APIs moving forward in terms of managing the complexity of these systems. By the way, in a, similar, in a sector not that dissimilar to automotive, that is agri-tech, uh, they were able to converge on the ISOBUS standard. And everybody's happy. Everybody's building digital application on top of it. That's a, that's a really good example from outside our day to day that is uh, not nearly as outside as it, as it could be. There's a lot of overlap between the two. Don't care. Sure. Yeah. Um, 
Justin, you, you talked a bit about briefly containerization, virtual machines, and I just wanted, thought I'd actually throw Stefano a question about what kind of role do you see virtualization playing in this transformation of the way we do things as an industry? Do you want to start with that one, Stefano, or do you want me to jump in? So if you, if you look at uh, what virtualization actually um, opens the door to, it is um, the ability for us to reach or to extend our reach to a developer ecosystem that is far beyond uh, the traditional automotive development paradigm and the, the expertise that exists. The ability to run significantly different operating environments is very, very powerful um, on a singular on a singular ECU or a consolidated ECU. You're not necessarily um, shackled to the development tools that exist for a singular operating environment. Now with virtualization, uh, the world is your oyster, really. I mean, you can build up um, feature sets and persona per virtual machine or, or guest and leverage the developer tools, the you know, runtimes that exist in each one of those disparate operating environments to really truly solve an integrated problem or create a solution. Uh, to the, the to these integration problems, I think it's extremely important. In fact, I fundamentally believe, even if I cover my who I work for aside, fundamentally believe that virtualization is arguably the key enabler from an SDV perspective in order for us to more broadly reach the the developers that SDV promises. Really interesting yeah. viewpoint. Yeah, uh, Stefano, did you have anything you wanted to, to throw in on that one? I, I totally totally agree with Justin, and I think even, even in that, the role of hypervisors, it's uh, it's really important to mention a technology that uh, that needs to be deployed in as a mechanism to virtualize. Um, absolutely, uh, we are already. In fact, we are already doing it. So we started to uh, in in AWS, we started to introduce some innovations, where we are already able to load uh, in AWS. Uh, through our virtualization platform that is Nitro-based, uh, the name of our hypervisor, uh, to, to, to create uh, um, automotive uh, environments. And we just presented uh, this week at the Open Source Summit in North America in Austin, in Austin uh, quite a, an interesting mechanism that can take an embedded operating system, Yocto in the specific, and uh, automatically create an, an instance of that embedded system in cloud. So you will have not anymore just Ubuntu or Amazon Linux too, but you have that specific embedded operating system running natively through virtualization in cloud. And whatever you develop in there can just be deployed, right? And this changes a little bit the paradigm because you can see the cloud not anymore just a space where you just have a big data or SAP, but it's a, an effective development environment for embedded code, right? For development, testing, validation at scale. That's the big problem, what the very big problem that the sector face in terms of complexity. And virtualization really provides, I mean, uh, uh, it's a great paper, by the way. Um, I, I read it the other day. Um, the, the virtualization at the cloud level really does provide that environmental parity from a cloud and edge perspective. Now, um, the white paper is written for a particular operating environment in mind, but if we start thinking about things like the critical edge, like automotive really right. is, what does it mean to be bit, to have bit parity between cloud technology and runtimes that that potentially developers are using or simulations or others with the actual ECU platform software that exists? Now we start talking about a lot of power that the cloud provides as an extension to those platforms. It's it's that whole idea of bit parity between ECU software foundationally and things that are running in the cloud. These are the types of things that really get me excited about the future in terms of what we're doing. Fantastic, and that, that is, and if we think back from where the industry was 15, 20 years ago, it's just mind blowing, the difference of, of what you can do. Um, so given that we've got all of these advances, um, does it really matter where the software comes from that goes into a car? Does it matter if it's own built, <laughs> tier one so software, open source, uh, <laughs> vendor software, in terms of, getting it to run together on a car does is the source yeah. of the software really such a big deal anymore then i have a, i have a perspective there that okay. there's a little yeah. bit uh, you know in uh, outside uh, the specific context of the question but uh, goes at the core of the question where does all this software come from from developers 
and uh, in automotive it's you know i think it's uh, at the very end that's the that's the final people the final person that they really produce the software and in auto you know that's that has to be respected because if you think about the various car components developers are used to their own tool right so if you develop powertrain maybe you use matlab simulink or uh, you know some control framework if you develop infotainment you have your tools for infotainment development graphics management if you develop android application you have your your framework so it's really not just uh, you know a macro point of view from the om perspective but how we can serve developers to do better their their job and work right for example developers nowadays are extremely extremely limited by the capability to develop by the need to have an external hardware to work with it's absurd right it's uh, it's just in automotive that happens that you must have an evaluation kit to create an infotainment application why so that's that's why we need virtualization but without changing the workflows for the developers just making it faster and giving him him or her more possibility to to test or scale out testing right so i think this is an important point and we start to see weird software coming in let back be the part of for the world but gaming right or i saw recently a concept of a car that is crypto that is doing big uh, bitcoin crypto mining when i went plugged and just uh, you have four gpus what you do you just mine crypto right so Software, software, this diversity of software developers really will touch many, many different areas, but those are the real targets that we really work with to create this framework. Um, in my opinion, to directly answer the question, yes, absolutely. It absolutely matters where software comes from for any number of reasons, not the least of which are things like liability, <laughs> length mm -hmm. of support, uh, investment. Um, you really need to make sure that when you're designing these systems that, uh, you know, and again, I am not against open source or anything like that. I truly fundamentally believe that open source is great and there are plenty of programs out there that, that provide significant value. At the same time, um, I, I believe that there is significant value in the, the concept of trusted, dependable partnerships from a software perspective where you can go to somebody and say, this is broken, you need to fix it. It doesn't always have to land squarely on the integrator or the OEM. As the poll said, you know, uh, most of the people on the on the webinar believe that 60% 60, 60 or more um, the OEM writes. That's a lot of work for the OEM or the integrator to support. So the rest of the system, do they want to support the rest of the, the non-differentiating software as well? Or does it make sense to integrate trusted, dependable, Com commercially managed or open or whatever the case may be, but I truly believe, yes, absolutely, uh, there is, uh, you, you need to know where the software comes. Not only do you need to know, but there are, you know, legislative things in the world today that dictate you must know where everything comes from. So, uh, yeah, I mean, there's there's this, the softer side of it, the non-technical side of it of uh, liability and investment and focus and all of those types of things. I think that's why it's really important where, where software comes from, even if it does hit the mark in terms of feature sets, et cetera. Yeah, one, one closing thought here, just to kind of t tie together both what, what both of you said is that, um, you know, it, it, it matters not just in the sense of, of liability um, and not just in, in the sense of, you know, where the developers are sitting, but you know, the, the supply chain crisis in, in automotive is well understood, but there's another one and that's in kind of the, the talent to actually kind of develop the software to begin with. So I think in the same, breath as, as this quote on the screen um the uh, he, he also mentioned that they're going to hire up to i think 10,000 software developers in, into cariad and you know they're not the only ones pursuing that that same development talent so whether you know on the same side of that you've got kind of a, a large workforce in the oem that's oriented towards sort of i'm not going to call it the legacy but kind of the, the way that the car is designed developed um and, and tested today and and that's not going sort of anywhere quickly at the same time. So uh, a hugely complex challenge to kind of balance the the existing workforce, training new staff, hiring new staff, and then kind of organizing this all together in a coherent way such that you actually kind of have a vision for the, the software platform uh, and can make tactical strategic decisions on where that software comes from, uh, whether internally, uh, externally, or, or a blend thereof. Fantastic. We're starting to get some good questions through. So when we get to the Q&A section in the last uh, quarter hour or so, 
I think it's going to generate some even more uh, good conversation. But for now, we'll jump on to our next uh, part of this topic. Uh, you, you mentioned there, Justin, about uh, long-term support um, and software is, as the quote on the, the page says, a driving force in the automotive industry. Um, and as software becomes part of the life cycle revenue uh, model for a lot of OEMs, it has to last a bit longer and be more updatable than it ever used to be. Um, how would you see the the automotive life cycle impacting the way software is integrated and managed? Um, Justin, you want to jump onto that one first? Sure. Great question. Great question. I think that um, the the idea of continuous integration, continuous deployment, uh, continuous innovation is a uh, is a very complicated and long discussion to have, but it's where we're headed. Um, I believe that these pipelines are becoming more and more complicated, and it's going to be in the best interests of everybody that's servicing this market to um, collaborate, uh, even at the lifecycle management level. The idea of being able to deploy um, non-safe updates to vehicles and OTA and all of those types of things, although happen today, aren't you know super widely deployed today. Um, but when we start taking a look at what consolidation means, now we're not talking about just non-safe updates, we're talking about updates to safety critical systems regardless of the update. So we really have to start understanding the levels, levels of complexity even within the life cycle and the management therein about how we're deploying these types of software. And again, that's open platform, open source, commercially managed. It's at the end of the day, there's a certain set of criteria from a safety and security perspective that must be maintained in these consolidated environments. Again, with, with consolidation means that there will be a safety element in that system because you're consolidating infotainment with DMS or something like that, right? So the idea is, although the thing you're updating may not have a safety concept or a safety context, the system you're updating does. It is the safety context, right? So we have to make sure that we have uh, levels of management throughout the entire life cycle to make sure A, that the software is correct, but also that the requirements have been met. And we have to make sure that these types of things are very machine readable and highly integrated so that through automated testing, we can do automated validation against requirements and safety cases and concepts and things like that. And this is where I think, uh, Stefano, we get back into what it means to be um, integrated into those workflow management things like ECS, like AK, EKS, or even just EC2 in general, just being able to manage the compute and the resources necessary for a lot of these things. Uh, I, I really think that a deeper integration of those cloud level services and what it means to be deployed in, in, a, in a safety context is, is key moving forward. Yeah, definitely. Fantastic. Um, Stefano, did you have any thoughts now that you, you, you're in your new role? You're, you are Mr. SDV as a day-to-day -day role now. Do you have any thoughts on where the software life cycle is moving compared to where it's been over the last uh, 10 years or so? So, yes, a couple of things. So um, you you touched, uh, and coming back to some of Justin's comment, you touched uh, the magic keyword at the beginning of this conversation, mixed critical orchestration, right? That is the like uh, this important concept where we have I don't know, a rear seat infotainment workload uh, with uh, a powertrain management workload, right? Both things exist in a car. Rear seat infotainment is obviously non-functional critical, while powertrain, it is highly, highly critical, right? X by wire system, right? By wire break, by wire, whatever, right? How we do package and distribute this code uh, in this way, in a microservice fashion, again, uh, for whatever is possible. And uh, so, Surely we start with uh, a, um, an approach that is uh, cloud native, and uh, we start with at least uh, two uh, customers, it's public, uh, so with uh, a Continental and Stellantis, you saw in both uh, collaborations that we are having that the concept of a cloud native workbench for engineering workbench uh, is an important element of the collaboration in both cases. And that's a kind of uh, logic because, uh, you know, as AWS, the most important, uh, you know, action that we do when we start with the customer is probably structuring the data lake. The data coming from the vehicle and from connected vehicle is already in the cloud. So where you want to put the development environment or the tools that use the data, it's just contiguous to the, the area where the, the storage, our S3 service and everything is related to that, right? 
So the cloud has, has a role in that because if you think about the simulation, all the testing, all the data that is there coming, it's really fed all the, the system under test, system under development. And, and again, if you achieve the parity that Justin was mentioning, you can really test the system in the cloud, the software system with the proper level of abstraction that then guarantee that that software can be taken and installed in the vehicle, right? Leveraging this abstraction to the specific IOs that the vehicle presents in a hardware way that obviously we don't have in the cloud, like CAN or whatever other IO that is available in the car. And, uh, and that's an important and important part. Uh, and it's an important modification in the life cycle of the software. And not just in the way uh, of the work. The workbench then has a series of uh, what we call AMI again. These AMI are an important thing because those, those are environments, right? So AMI for us is Amazon Machine Image, is a set of operating system and libraries that we launch on top of our servers. And that environment can be a OEM AMI, right? And this OEM AMI can be distributed with parity. So whatever you develop in there will just work on your vehicle. And you distribute this AMI, open this AMI to your ecosystem. And the ecosystem can work inside this AMI with parity with what then goes on the vehicle itself. It's a completely new way of, uh, again, not just uh, taking or exchanging software, but uh, exchanging environments that, that enable the creation of software with parity. Fantastic. Thank and you if we that. look at that, so that's Stefano coming from top down from a cloud perspective, yep. but there's also the bottom up side of it as well. When, when we start talking about embedded development and what it means to actually manage critical mixed environments, right? So the idea of knowing more and more of the context of the system, for instance, would make that abstraction level easier to manage the things underneath it. And I think that that's where you know, there's going to be industry collaboration and why I think some of the the, uh, the groups that are forming around that abstraction level, I think, uh, could be key moving forward. But really, what we're talking about is the ability for us as an industry to manage workload in a mixed critical environment, uh, not a solved problem. <laughs> so, no. Uh, <laughs> uh, and, we wouldn't uh, have any attendees if it were. What's that? We wouldn't have any attendees if it were. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but I, I believe it's, it's, you know, it's fundamentally, it is like-minded technology organizations that are looking at this as, as the real problem. It is the how do I manage, to Stefano's uh, example, how do I manage the powertrain and the infotainment sets of workloads they have, disparate types of technology. It could be a VM, it could be a container, it could be native binaries, dependent upon the characteristics of the execution environment how do i schedule all of those things how do i manage all of those things how do i meter and report those things back to a grander orchestration how do like how do we do that and still make the freedom from interference claims and separation and segregation claims that are required in order to still hit the safety requirements of these systems unfortunately i don't have a solution i'd love to say and today i have the cunix you know what i'm saying but uh uh, I, I uh, it's definitely something that's you know hitting our wheelhouse as a, a foundational platform software organization. These are the types of things that we're looking at um, and working with some some very interesting partners about <laughs> how we take the top and the bottom <laughs> and make things happen. Well, if we take the top and the bottom, Alex, we end up meeting in the middle um, with any luck at all. Uh, how, how do you see the industry approaching this need to find that abstraction layer cooperatively and, and bring together a combination of open platforms, commercial platforms, their own ideas, and, and try to get some of this uh, commonization that we, we touched on very early on in the, in the webinar? How, how do you see the industry approaching some of that? Well, I'll, I'll get to that question in a second, but I kind of want to frame it because um, it, it's relevant to again what both both Justin and, and Stefano were saying. Um, you know, there's a lot of unsolved problems, but I would say maybe the the most obvious one to me is actually kind of the maturation of the product development process to begin with. So, you know, in our in discussions with um, with OEMs, you know, there's a lot of um, I'm not going to call it classical thinking, but maybe maybe traditional thinking and in, in how kind of milestones need to be met. And even though we're saying, oh, we're going to introduce this you know, high performance compute, um, you know, we're going to be changing or iterating on our, our EE platform, 
it's still there's I think there's a fundamental disconnect between kind of what we're talking about in in principle and and what's being done kind of at a, a management level um, within OEMs. So, you know, first and foremost, um, there needs to be sort of a, a more nuanced level of thinking in terms of how the core platform development is managed and how sort of application software is managed in order to achieve actually that more sustainable, manageable um, kind of software platform in the vehicle over time. So the key enabler in that, besides the, the process, is in that abstraction and management layer. And, and to that effect, um, you know, this, this concept of, of middleware, um, to, to kind of borrow, a, again, an enterprise IT term, um, it, it, it's interesting because there, there's no like one set path. So adaptive auto SAR is one great example of, of, a, of a, a standard or a, you know, a set of APIs that um, is being uh, used in, in various domains. But you know, I, I think you know, some of the, the, the projects um, and consortia that are coming together to talk about how do we sort of start standardizing those interfaces, that's going to be foundational to that conversation. The unfortunate problem being that kind of this first next gen of um, vehicle platforms that OEMs are developing aren't going to be able necessarily to leverage the, the fruits of that labor. So we're still going to have a bit of fragmentation in the industry as we sort of evolve towards a, a more mature thinking about the, the non-differentiating um, and enabling uh, software. Evolution, not revolution, right? Exactly. Fantastic. By, 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 by necessity, you know, in a way. Yeah. Yeah. We, we can go at, at a faster pace, but it's still at a pace that we can go at. Um, yeah. With that in mind, let's see if we can uh, get another question for our audience, wake everybody up, get it back involved before we go to this last bit of this, uh, this webinar. Um, so Alex, if you can ha have a read out of that one, please. Yeah, our second question is, um, which of these following options delivers the highest value benefit from cloud-based tools within your continuous integration, continuous delivery process, or CICD? Select one, simulation for testing software, software composition analysis, integration coordination, or automated delivery. Again, the question is, which of these following options delivers the highest value benefit from cloud-based tools within your CI CD process? Now, there are many other tools available for certain, but I thought we'd choose a selection of ones and get an indication from the audience uh, where they, they sit, what they, they see as the, the biggest value generators for, for their day-to-day -day world. Um, so we'll give everybody a minute or so to uh, click on a button there, and then we will carry on with our last topic and question for the day before we open up to questions. Let's see, we'll give another- Just as a ten. quick color commentary on this, it's, it's quite interesting to, to see the, the actual tools um, mature uh, to, to allow this type of, of software development to happen. I think just, you know, maybe two years ago, um, there, there really wasn't, wasn't anything in this space that um, was mature enough uh, to, to really kind of think about this in a realistic sense. So very, very quick yeah. and, and relevant development here. Yeah, we'll give everybody about 10 seconds and then we can pick up on this. Um, righty, let's go ahead and close that and see if we can get some answers. Okay, so from the results that the two um, highest questions are with 43% simulation for testing software and 32 percent integration coordination software composition analysis comes in at 19 percent and automated delivery a, a low six uh, percent so simulation and, and integration coordination being the two two main ones which is i think that's a, a fair way to say that that's a, a good uh, description of where we are as an industry at the moment is the first thing we always think about in automotive at least in my experience, is how do we test to make sure it's safe to put on the road? And then we'll worry about making it more efficient to develop uh, after we're sure about that. So if we can close that answer, we can pop on to the last topic of uh, our discussion. So given all of what we said, one of the biggest questions OEMs, tier ones, anybody who is acquiring software has to have is, how do I know what I'm supposed to be doing? So what kind of questions can OEMs and tier ones ask themselves so that they can decide what, what software to integrate and how they're gonna do it? Um, because they're gonna include 
software from a range of sources. They're going to have to have different strategies for build and buy. And at the end of the day, it all has to work together. So given all of that uh, fruit salad of software, if you like, um, Justin, what kind of challenge do you think uh, manufacturers and suppliers might encounter that will help them decide which questions to ask themselves? Well, I think that there's, you know, four real categories uh, of challenge when we start looking at the future that we're talking about here in terms of foundational and platform software development. Scale is the first. Scale is going to be the largest challenge, uh, at least the first challenge. Scale in regards to workload management and orchestration, hardware, vehicle data, and we've said it a couple of times, talent. Second is complexity. Complexity is comprised of everything from development complexity, multiple operating environments, commonality in terms of the platforms, uh, the ability to run different types of workloads in these, in these runtime environments. And let's not forget the idea of mixed criticality here, that it itself is extremely complex. Uh, safety and security is the third pillar that I see with um, a lot of the, the regulations moving forward in certain geographic locations uh, in terms of security. And then we're all very familiar with uh, the automotive safety standards. Uh, enablement from a software-defined software vehicle perspective, what does that mean in terms of safety and security? As we're broadly opening things, does that mean now we have to be, we have to be extra cautious in the first place from a security perspective, but are we, what are we doing as a, as a, in this, inside the consortia or inside the, the industry as a whole, if we're opening things more and more, what does it mean and what does it, what does it impact from a security perspective? And really, I think, uh, not necessarily, well, it's a challenge, but also I think a significant opportunity is what does it mean to be cloud enabled? It isn't necessarily just the traditional connected services, GPS, navigation, all of those types of things. But, you know, we mentioned things like simulation and integration control and management and things like that. But also, um, you know, people talk about digital twin and data representations of vehicles in the cloud and all of those types of things. But as we get more and more uh, close to bit parity in terms of the software that runs in vehicle and in the cloud, we can start talking less about twinning and more about true replication and what it means to potentially be to augment these systems from a cloud perspective as well. Now, there are a whole host of safety things that I'm sure people will want to ask, and I'm not saying that we go and safety certify the entire EC2 stack because Stefano will kill me if I say that. So, <laughs> uh, but the idea Very of being able to that will augment, never happen. <laughs> but the idea of being able to augment certain processes like retraining uh, certified models, for instance, right? So you can ingest data from uh, a pedestrian detection system or something like that, ingest data into a, a cloud-based bit, bit identical system and do training and learning in the cloud with infinite CPU scale, take that information, feed it automatically back into the CI-CD pipeline, rebuild all of the things and then have that validation back through so you're getting a bi-directional feed through that CI CD pipeline. And I think that that's where cloud really is going to start, you know, helping us in terms of, of, of these challenges, at least cloud enablement will start helping us in those, in those, uh, in those cases. Fantastic. Yeah, Just before we open up to questions, uh, sorry to, to cut you off, uh, Stefano, we're about to yeah, run out of our, our panel time. So I'm going to open up to questions, but I was going to ask Alex one quick question. Given all that, what kind of criteria, how, how do OEMs uh, and tier ones decide how to get their software, where to get their software? Yeah, at, at, at its core, it's it's a tactical decision that's driven by by the, the corporate strategy, right? So no no none of these sourcing decisions are made in a vacuum. Um, it's all downstream of, of the strategy that, that the OEM takes on. And so, you know, as a software organization, of the deliverables that you're committed to, you know, whether it be to a, to a product team, whether it be kind of just as, as core enablers to your, your, your brands, et cetera. Um, you know, as a software team, you are, are responding to the direction of the company. So whether, you know, the business model is to continue to you know, focus on passenger vehicles or moving more towards fleet oriented sales, um, you know, the process and, and kind of after sales business model. So are you, looking to like strongly monetize that that customer experience the customer journey through continuous updates and introduction of features of the lifetime of the car what price points are you playing at what markets are you playing at and how do you need to scale your platform between those segments all of these are really important inputs into kind of the decision calculus that architects 
and and software executives need to make when charting out their their um, technology strategy. So I would say that, you know, it's the core mandate to maybe the influencers and decision makers on this webinar today to really truly understand the direction of the company uh, and make sure that the partners that you're working with are ideologically and from a products and services perspective also directly aligned with the actual results and deliverables you're trying to achieve. Thanks. And uh, just before we go into the questions, because the first two are going to be, um, can we see the webinar after the fact? Yes, a link to it will be sent out in the next couple of days. Um, and where's the white paper? The link to that will be in the same email, and it does list a few different criteria in there that you can look at. They're fairly high level, but it helps you just look at the types of questions to ask yourself, depending on which type of company or what your corporate mandate is, what the company strategy is to help uh, make that decision. So I've got some questions. I'm going to pick them more or less from the order they came in, so we'll kind of go back to the topics. Um, the first one, what truly defines feature as a service, mobility as a service, feature function service as a true safety oriented product? Um, it's an interesting question, interesting way of thinking about fast and mass um, as needing to be safety oriented there in vehicles. So that you know there's always a safety indication. Does anybody have a, a desire to jump in there first? Or it's a really different way of looking at it, I think. It's interesting. Um, uh, anybody who's in the audience has, had, that has spoken to me about safety in the past, I'm going to say it depends, and they'll, they'll get it when I. <laughs> but it really depends on the safety concept that's associated with the thing that is going to be backing the particular service. Um, be, because there will be multiple ECUs, multiple platforms that will surface those services, um, there's going to have to be significant argumentation in between all of the various la layers to ensure that we insulate ourselves purely from a service perspective where we're doing the, the star AAS things um, from the actual critical or foundational components. But it's an interesting question. I've, to be honest, not really thought about from the that level what it means to, to truly affect the safety case, but um, the unfortunate safety answer is it depends. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm, my, my immediate thought was I'm thinking of features like um, configurable suspension. You know, I'm going away for a weekend to somewhere with a bit of a rough road. I want a softer ride. Great feature, great service. At some point in that stack, you're hitting a safety critical system. So yep. dynamicism is an interesting core problem set to solve from a safety perspective, yes. Yeah, yeah, it really is. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, the frameworks anyway are uh, are there to help, right? So functional safety and the safety of the internet functionality with a data, with a connected approach, right? So I think uh, frequently we mm, tend to forget that the human anyway is relevant in a human automation interaction perspective, even in, in guiding the evolution of the system, right? So. No, that's, that's, a, that's a good way of thinking about it. We have another question that I, came to my mind at the end of the first poll. We said that pretty much everybody says that currently the OEM software stack is effectively 60% or greater owned, um, which is kind of the opposite of where the VW quote came from, saying uh, a couple of years ago they were at 10%, they want to be at 60% in three years' time. Um, the questioner says, does this reflect paraphrase it, a bit of a misunderstanding about the complexity and return of value for different types of automotive software um, and what owning software actually means. Is, is there, in, do, you, do you feel in the industry across software owners, integrators, we think OEMs, tier ones, major software integration companies, is there a real appreciation of what it means to actually own 60 80 percent of the software in the car yeah i mean we i i think if i can kind of take a, a first stab at this i i think what we've seen time and time again is a bit of a, a whipsaw uh within the industry um you know kind of back and forth where where a lot of the root of this pain is 
in the inability to change. So, you know, if you want to introduce a new feature after the sale of the vehicle, if you want to improve the user experience, if you want to act on customer feedback, it's incredibly difficult in the kind of OEM tier one out, you know, fully outsourced system integration model to, to be responsive to consumers and kind of the competitive um, ecosystem. So, you know, I would say that's kind of the biggest driving factor. And in, you know, it depends on the OEM. I think a, a lot of OEMs do have a reasonably um, strong appreciation for the complexity that they're taking on, hence kind of the size of the investments that are being made. But um, I think what we will end up seeing is a bit of a challenge in terms of being able to achieve the same level of initial quality of, of vehicles that are built and definitely more of um, a, a learning process in, in terms of not just kind of the product itself, but organizing the, the teams to succeed. So definitely a challenge there that, that we've observed in sort of our work, but um, you know, it, it's really in response to some very specific and sort of existential pain points that exist in, in the current model. So you know, all that to say, um, you know, software partners that are contributing into that software um, supply chain, I think also have a great understanding of how they need to change um, to, to adapt to that sort of new OEM life cycle and some of the, the paradigms that they're bringing to the table. Yeah, so you could say that uh, there's a growing appreciation of, of, of what it means to uh, own software. It would be maybe yes. a, a, a way of describing the variety of, uh, of levels across the, the industry. Um, another question I, I see here I'm going to throw out to you is, uh, so do you see either consortia or other groups defining tests and functional specs so that everybody plays nicely together, um, like uh, when Google does with CTS, VTS for someone developing a smartphone? Interesting, interesting concept, but I think we have to build on the, the whole idea of open standard and commonalization. Before we can start doing test specification, CTS and VTS and those types of things, they're they're standard, right, <laughs> for those yes. environments. So I think that uh, the consortium themselves is is a great first step in terms of the the, the open standards and, and and the potential there. Um, mm -hmm. But I think that before we can start doing test specification, there needs to be commonalization uh, across the board. Yeah. Uh, and I think we're we're kind of at the infancy of that right now. Yeah. 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 That's why again, uh, again, to tackle the, the mixed critical uh, orchestration problem, right? We uh, create Sophie, right? Uh, with ARM and other partners, carried uh, Woven and others. Uh, that's exactly so totally agree, Justin. That's basic layer that guarantees, right, the mixed critical orchestration. So how you describe a workload in terms of its functionality and criticality? Yep. That's uh, that's the starting point. Yeah, it's, it's hard to define a test spec that's common if you're coming from 32 different places. And but it, it once it, you know, if commonalization does occur, then obviously, yeah, I mean, test specifications on the, the the packaging details of the deployed workload and the APIs necessary to actually do the callbacks to the orchestration hosts and all of those types of things. Absolutely, I would I would think that the organizations responsible for creating those standards. Can at least create test specifications whether or not they actually write the code remains to be seen uh, could be a business opportunity <laughs> <laughs> fantastic um in terms of software defined vehicles how is the service oriented architecture getting rolled out uh, and uh, considering more and more hpc zone controllers etc at the same time um how is 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 there a sort of a factor in in that architecture that needs to be considered as part of the software reuse target. Sorry, I may have paraphrased that one a bit oddly, uh, but in terms of as we centralize our architectures, as we put together the service-oriented architecture layer that is supporting the software-defined vehicle, are we seeing mm -hmm. an approach where the hardware roadmap is actually a key factor in in what you're targeting the software reuse for. I'm still working around cycles on this, this question, I think. Um, okay. Yeah, I can well, take uh, a go, go ahead. That. 
So it's, uh, you know, hardware consolidation is happening. So now modern cars have multi-core system. So when you have multi-core, the immediate question is how you partition, right? How you virtualize and allocate those cores to different operating systems processes. So that's the first level of the virtualization. On top of that, we still, you still have binaries and you have, you have containers, right? So uh, Justin was mentioning EKS, ECS, those are our tools to orchestrate containers, right? Uh, and now we use those in, uh, in cloud, uh, even if ECS anywhere can reach uh, an embedded target potentially, but uh, you know, uh, that's, that's an, initial, an initial thing. But uh, you know, container is the way that uh, modern uh, uh, microservices are, are uh, let's say, you know, packaged, right? So, and, uh, and that comes with all the advantages of using container. And this is just an example. Again, the sector is really right now in uh, uh, finding uh, ways to package uh, and again, break down the monolith, create these packages that can impl Think about an autonomous driving stack where you have perception, planning and control, um, sensor fusion, all, this, all the layers. Those can be microservices and each function can be a container that is just, uh, you know, that feeds the other coming down. And this is, for example, what uh, Autoware is doing with the Open AD Kit initiative, breaking down the original Autoware stack in containers and microservices, because then you can evolve faster each of them. Now, perception, you just work and you have a team dedicated to perception that can evolve it and update just that part, right? And because the interfaces are well defined with the rest. So, this is a modern way to break down and interpret. Uh, this uh, packaging service-oriented microservice approach. Fantastic, thank you. Um, that leads me to the last question I was holding off towards the end because it's the one that's going to affect the actualities of getting these systems on the road. Um, the questioner says, SDB and associated developments are great, but how difficult is it, is it going to be to get type approvals? Because certainly one size doesn't fit all. Do we see challenges just in the general type approvals and if we leave aside r155 and cybersecurity management systems of the software uh, just does the software defined vehicle fit the traditional homologation model of measure this measure that make sure it's within tolerances how are those two things going to work together I mean, at a, at a fundamental level, the, the product has to operate the same way um, at, at, from, from a, a safety critical perspective. So if, if you're looking at, at safety regulations, uh, I, I don't see any really any reason to, to change the, the way that the vehicle is homologated you know, from, from core safety. Now, when we start thinking about some of the newer regulations, you mentioned cybersecurity, but also you know, OTA with R156 and automatic lane keeping systems, autonomy, that's different. And, and I think one underappreciated point around this is that it's new for the, the regulators and technical services as well. So not only are OEMs learning, but the regulators are learning as well. Um, and, and there's going to be a, a significant round of sort of understanding each other um, over the next couple of years as some of these new vehicles get, get type approved. Um, and so I, I don't think it's a matter of, of necessarily like OEMs and their suppliers versus the regulators. It's a matter of sort of OEMs developing um, sort of the, the first wave of capabilities um, that, that are aligned to some of the emerging regulations. There's a matter of, of regulators training and, and educating their staff, hiring people who understand the tech stack and what goes into it. Um, and then sort of, of working you know, with the industry um, in, in partnership to, to find the right model that you know, protects um, consumers and uh, you know, passengers, pedestrians, et cetera, while at the same time, you know, um, kind of working with the OEMs as, as they kind of adjust how, how they um, uh, build vehicles as well. So that's kind of my broad take, but um, I'm, I'm sure that the others here have a perspective as well. We've got about a minute left to, if anybody else wants to jump in on that one. I was just say it comes back to the whole evolution versus revolution statement, right? So we need to evolve with not just the technology, but the regulators and everything else. Yeah, fantastic. And on, on that, no, I think I'll say thank you to everyone who's uh, stayed with us for the hour. I think it was a fascinating conversation. I certainly learned a lot from you guys. I hope uh, you were able to learn a little bit from each other and that everybody on board 
got something uh, valuable out of it they can take home and help the industry move forward. So thank you, everybody. Awesome. Thanks a lot, everybody. Yeah. Bye-bye. Thank you.